get us set up on Facebook Live real quick. So, um, so welcome. Uh, today we are having a tea hour program. Um, so usually we have our coffee hour programs, but today is going to be featuring some tea, which is fun. Um, this program is part of our virtual art series produced by the Guild of Artists and Artisans. I'm Elizabeth. I'm the gallery and program manager with the Guild, um, and I'm really looking forward to bringing you guys today's program. Uh, these programs are an opportunity for um, you guys to meet artists, uh, tour their studio, uh, watch some art demos, uh, shop for artwork, and more. Um, each program will be unique from the rest, so we encourage you guys to check them all out, either live here on Zoom or on Facebook Live. Um, you can also catch the recorded versions later on our YouTube channel, and that's uh, the Guild of Artists and Artisans YouTube channel. Uh, today's Tea Hour is hosted by John Gutowski and Peter Sparling. John and Peter are two incredible artists living in Ann Arbor, um, and today they are going to bring you into their home studios for tours, some demos, um, some really fun giveaways, so stay tuned for those, um, and of course tea. Uh, they're going to be uh, bringing in their friend and musician Frank Powell uh, for some live music while you get settled in as well. So that should be a fun one. Um, before we dive into the program today, I do want to make you guys aware of a couple of things, um, specifically with the giveaways that um, John and Peter are going to be doing today. Um, so if you this if you're not new to Zoom, this is probably all uh, you you know all of this. But um, if you are on your laptop, I just want to. Um, point out where our comment box is. If you're on a laptop, it's going to be in the right corner of your screen. You can access it by hovering your, um, your uh, mouse um, on the bottom and you should find a little chat box that you can pull up. Um, a quick note about that, um, when you pull your chat box up, you can type messages um, specifically to certain people. Um, we are the panelists, so uh, myself, John and Peter and Frank, um, our musician. Um, so if you want to send a private note just to us, um, you, you're welcome to send um, a comment to uh, panelists, um, and that's what I believe you're, it's going to default to you. Um, however, if you'd like to engage with everyone and you want to um, write a comment for everyone to see, uh, if you hit your drop down box in your comment section, you have the option to send your comment to all panelists and attendees, um, and that's what you would want to click to send a message to everyone. So I just want to point that out real quick because it does default you just to send messages to us. Um, if you have any questions, you can leave them in the comment section. You can also, um, you can also leave us a, a question in the question box, which is down at the bottom of the screen here. Um, if you roll your cursor over it, you should find it. If you're on your cell phone, you might need to scroll through to find these things. But um, I just want to make sure everyone takes a moment to find those so that when we, um, when John and Peter do their giveaways, you know where all of that stuff is. So um, I am going to actually bring up John and Peter now. Um, they're going to give you guys a brief little introduction about themselves, um, and they will introduce their friend um, and musician, Frank. So let's go here. Let me bring them up. Hi, Hello. guys. Hey. Hi. Good morning. Thanks for being here today. Hi. It's so I'm going to let you guys, I know you have a really full, fun program for everybody, so I'm going to just let you guys take it right away. Um, we're so glad that you're here, and um, I know everyone's really excited, so I'll go ahead and just hide myself. <laughs> okay, Elizabeth, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our home. We're in our living room in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm sitting next to my husband, the artist dancer, choreographer, Peter Sparling. I just like to th say thank you to the Guild and to Elizabeth and Karen for inviting us to be part of this series. Um, you see, we're wearing our masks because we want to model taking care of other people. And so we're going to take them off now. You see our array of just hand sanitizers and disinfectants and PPE and living in the pandemic. And we just want to mark that for you in this video. So. Um, one of the things we want to do is um, some giveaways today. But before I do that, I just want to talk about my connection to the Guild. I actually did my first solo show at the Guild Gallery in 2000, 20 years ago, actually. And um, the gallery has since reopened. It had been closed for a while, and Elizabeth is running it. And Peter, I have um, 
currently have some pieces in the show that's up right now. And I also have a connection that I did when I was doing art fairs, I did several of the guilds fairs. So before we get to uh, Frank's intro, which Peter is gonna do, I have four masks. I've been making cotton masks. I don't know if you can see all these, but the first four people to type in the name of their favorite queer visual artist will get sent a mask to their home. All right, and now I'm gonna let Peter introduce Frank. Hi everyone, uh, while well, John adjusts the camera. Uh, we are delighted to have our dear friend and composer musician extraordinaire, Frank Paul, give us a little morning matinee intro. Um, Frank was raised in Wyandotte, Michigan. He's a 2010 Kresge Fellow and a graduate of U of M School of Art and Design. He has taught at both U of M and Detroit Center for Creative Studies. Uh, Frank has worked in several groups, inclu including Only a Mother, Sublime Wedge, Immigrant Sons, and currently in the Scavenger Quartet, a freeform musical group, and Little Bang Theory, a toy music trio. He frequently collaborates with his partner, Terry Saris, Terry High in Wisconsin. The Edward Film Festival audiences know them very well, along with their uh, uh, Little Bank Theory member Doug Shimon for their many extraordinary musical collaborations with filmmakers and also their international practice of scoring silent films and accompanying screenings live. And they are awesome. Frank has built and exhibited a lot of automatic instruments as gallery inst installations and for his various bands. And if you haven't seen them, maybe on Frank's website, but we'll have something to show you. On a more personal note, Frank is not only a good friend, he has provided music for dozens of my own videos and performance works. And I'm so pleased that he can be here to open our show. Frank, take it away. Yay, Frank! Bringing him up now. Are you there, Frank? Yes, I'm there. Uh, right. Remember, I'm hobbling. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, uh, and I'm so pleased to be part of, uh, of this show. Uh, the instrument that I'm going to be playing, uh, it was, it changed a lot over the last couple of days, but yesterday I fell down and sprained my ankle. So I wrote music for a sprained ankle. And uh, the main instrument is the celeste. And it's got a regular keyboard, but it's a clunky thing that is similar to a bell tower, uh, you know, Caroline. And, um, but basically I'm playing a glockenspiel uh, with a keyboard attached. And uh, there's, I'll be playing this instrument a little bit also, which um, is a, uh, it's tines that I've tuned. And um, I recorded a sample that I'll be playing with in just a little bit. So this is uh, music for a sprained ankle. Thank 
And those nasty notes, that's what my ankle is feeling like these days. But I am on the mend and back to Peter and John. Okay. Here we are. Hi there. We're trying to figure out the technology, so bear with us. Um, I, I don't know how we do this. I'm going to hand it over to Peter. Um, and he's going to have to figure it out. Elizabeth, are you there? I am here, and we have some winners. You so, do. Tell yeah. us who the winners are. Okay, so first up, um, Frank, that was awesome. Thank you so much. That yes, was Frank, thank you. Oh, thank you. It was fun. <laughs> um, okay, so our, our winners, I have our, our first four people who sent messages. Um, okay, uh, so first up is Terry Saris. Yay! First one. Um, our second winner was Emily, and I'm sorry if I'm gonna butcher your last name. Uh, Slamovitz. Yep. Yay, Emily. <laughs> Hi, we'll get you your mask. Awesome. Uh, third person was Tanya White. Tanya! <laughs> She's my LA. friend from college. Oh, cool. Early 80s. Hi, Tanya. You made it. She's in LA. She got up early for us. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Um, and then our fourth one is Julia Gourley Donahue. All right, Julia, our friends at the Krasel Arts Center. Hi out there in St. Joseph. <laughs> That's wonderful. All right, so we just have one technical question. We're sorry, we've not done this before. Is there a way for Peter to look through the lens so that he can see, or do we have to hold the screen at us to do this? Uh, you can flip it. Um, oh, geez, it's been a little while since I've had it on my phone, but um, at the bottom, I believe, there is a, a spot where you can flip your screen. Uh, hmm, the bottom. Let me see if I... Or um, perhaps if you, um, if you scroll maybe on your screen. Let's see. Ah, let's see. Uh, How about up there? We got it. Okay. Oh, there we go. Cool. Okay. So you can do it now. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Sorry about that. All right. And so, just a quick, um, one quick thing. I know um, John might say this in a minute, but um, if you guys are winners today, if we announce your name for anything, um, you can send John an email um, with your, uh, your address if he doesn't already have it, um, and he will, he'll mail that out to you. Um, and I, I'll link to his email in the comment section. Awesome. Thank right. you. Take it away. Right. Thanks, Elizabeth. So we're going to come into my studio. Uh, my studio is in a car and a half converted garage. And 
uh, I initially converted it because I used to be a therapeutic body worker. I did uh, polarity therapy and work with shock trauma, and I also was a massage therapist. And uh, about a decade ago, a little over a decade ago now, I switched my studio over into uh, my printmaking studio. So come with me. So this is the entranceway, and uh, it's where I have my flat files, and I have this uh, exposure unit I use to do all kinds of photo processes with printmaking. Um, these are a few of my current works. You, if you follow me on social media, you've probably seen these. Uh, this is my response to the pandemic, and I, I find my work is really topical, and I find that I work best when I'm responding to what's happening currently, and so this obviously is rich, this pandemic unfortunately rich, um, with a lot of visual information. So I was thinking of this idea of, you know, people were calling people heroes, and I was thinking, well, if they're heroes, that probably means there are villains, and I started looking into the etymology of the words pandemic and corona, and uh, pandemic means all people, corona is sort of halo or circle of light, and then pandemonium comes from um, the, where all demons go uh, in a poem. Who's, I can't remember, Pete. Do you remember the name of the author of that poem? Would it be Dante? Uh, it's not Dante. But anyway, I'll get back to you on that. So I just started thinking of this idea of angels and demons and that I would produce a series that sort of highlighted who the angels were and who the demons were. So this is the angel of testing and there are swabs as like a sort of cross swords on the chest. And I'm working with this image of the lungs, which I, is a silk screen done over this anatomical image. And um, I use a, a photo silk screen, a photo emulsion that I expose. And so I, I will talk about that a little bit more later. And then over here we have the demon of greed who has a Trumpian hairdo and tie, let's face it, and is of course smoking a cigar because, well, it's a respiratory disease. So I'm continuing to do this series. I'm aiming for maybe 20 or so of them. I'm, I've got about eight done. Um, we'll look at those in a little bit. Uh, this is the unit I use, the exposure unit. It's got a halide bulb, so it just allows me to do quick, strong, fast exposures that lead to a better image production. So if you come this way, this is the main part of my studio the full car garage part of it. And uh, this is my press. It's a beautiful top dash press. It's set up as a relief press right now, um, where I keep supplies, tools over here, uh, a window that looks out back. And then over here, you see where all my inks are and my glass top tables, which are essential to printmaking. It's what you mix inks on. Um, I'm set up to do some silk screen this morning, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, on this side is basically a sink and my computer equipment, my printer, my scanner, my computer, and a digital cutting unit, which I use to cut out stencils. Um, and then over here is the drying rack. So this is where I leave prints to dry. It's where I store the prints while I'm working, because I tend to work in a series. So I start a bunch of things, and I just keep working. So these are pieces that are in process. They, they are at the beginnings. They sort of have backgrounds in them. And then below are the finished prints. And so these are, this is that series I was talking about, the angels and demons of the pandemic. And this is the angel of truth. And again, you'll see that silk screen. It's a lot called a lung tree. And so obvious, it's so obvious why it's called a lung tree. When you see it upside down, it looks like a tree. Um, and I decided that I would sort of build the series around the lungs because of the respiratory illness, the way that the COVID-19 gets into the body. So um, this is the angel of PPP. And in the background of all of them are these stencils. Um, you'll see sort of outlines of masks, gloves in this one. I um, can't remember what else is in the background. Masks and gloves, I think, and virus. And so I'm using all these little stencils that I cut out and lay on to the plate that I've inked. And that's how I'm getting those background images. And so then once I build the background up, I start adding the figure and the wings and the halos and just build the image till I feel that it's finished. I'm trying to get these plates to, these prints to glow. I want them to feel like, you know, this idea of a circle of light or a halo that they, they're lit within, that they give sort of a glow to them. This is the demon of propaganda. And in the background, there are viruses and the words hoax and COVID-19 all over it. The angel of truth had the words facts and truth in the background. This is the demon of the COVID virus, and it's basically virus and the words COVID-19 in the background. 
and the multi-faced demon. Uh, this is the angel of disinfectants, and there's bottles of bleach and spray disinfectant, and that's what's also in the background, our little bottles of bleach and, and uh, spray bottles. This is the angel of hand sanitizer, and uh, it features hands, bottles of hand sanitizer and, and gold virus. Um, this is a current series of, I did for Walt Whitman's birthday last year, the 200th anniversary of his birth. And this is another kind of uh, photo um, uh, media that I use. These are these plates that are meant to look like kind of photogravure plates. And I took images off the um, Library of Congress website of Walt and I reproduced them using plates so they looked like they were sort of uh, reproductions done in that old, in the style that would have been used when Walt was alive. Um, there's another, it's a different kind of a plate that it's a film that you add onto a piece of plastic and then expose with a, with a positive. And I'll show you that process in a little bit. Uh, another one from that Walt series, and again, another one of those <coughs> images, excuse me. Uh, this is a series called um, Climbing Out of, oh no, sorry, this is a series called Liminal Landscapes. And it's about this idea of in-betweenness. And I, I feel like right now we're kind of all in a liminal state. We're in this in-between time. We've left this place that we know we can't go back to, but we don't really know where we're going, you know? The, the future is unwritten. And so we're in this in-between state, which it can be kind of uncomfortable to live in, especially when <laughs> your ability to move about is, is limited because you don't want to die. So I, I just am sort of newly appreciating that idea of liminality because Right now, it's a universal experience. We're all in this in-betweenness. And it can be uncomfortable, so you know, be nice to yourself. I'm taking solace in my studio. I'm putting all my rage and my fear and my hopes and um, worries in trying to do kind of things for other people, like making masks or coming into my studio and making work about what's happening. Um, it's keeping me really from losing my mind. And I think my husband, Peter, would agree. He's doing the same thing. Um, and then this is a series, it's called Climbing Out of the Abyss. Uh, and it's, it's actually, I made these after Donald Trump was elected and how I struggled so much to deal with how I felt emotionally, but also um, trying to find some sort of hope and some way out of it, a, a kind of restoring my faith in mankind and womankind and humankind. Um, and so these are sort of an address of that. You see, I'm kind of obsessed with the human form you know, I started as a costume designer, so I first I dressed bodies, and then I ended up going into body work, and so I tried to heal bodies. And now, as a visual artist, I make work about bodies, and I, I just love the rich symbolism of the human form. It's a universal, and it's also a personal experience. And that translates to your pants. <laughs> my pandemic jeans, Peter's showing my... I have been adding up, these are my work jeans, which I patched, you know, they're older jeans and I use them in my studio. And I started patching them before the pandemic started with these embroidered patches. I have now been adding a patch a week. There are already three on it. So 10 patches since we've been quarantined. And I intend to add a patch a week until this is over. And it's a lot of anatomical stuff and skulls and Mexican wrestling masks, kidney, lungs and heart, the ears, the intestines, the mouth, the eyes. I, what can I say? I like the body of symbolism. Okay, so let's go over here. I don't want to take all of the time because Peter's, Peter's got to go too. So over here, I've set up just some examples of those photo processes I was talking about. This is a silk screen that I've already exposed. It's coated with this film that's sensitized with a, a photo sensitizer. It's called Diazzo. And you take a transparency film with the image and you lay it on top and you expose it in that unit to, with the halide bulb. And then the image gets burned into the screen. So essentially the light hardens wherever the emulsion has light exposed to it. And it doesn't where the image is. And you take it to the sink and you rinse it and the image falls out and you end up with the silk screen. So that's how a simple silk screen is done. Same idea with these plates that I was talking about. Uh, they, are, they have sort of a texture to them, like almost a grain and they're also photosensitive. You use a different kind of transparency. You see it's not a solid black one because these plates are super sensitive. So you use a much lesser uh, um, depth of black uh, and then you expose these. And these are really fast, like a 10 second exposure. And then you develop these in water and vinegar. And then the other, uh, this is a, a film 
it's a photo film that comes on a roll and you attach it to plastic, it's just a piece of plastic, uh, using a squeegee in water. And then again, you expose it. I couldn't find the, uh, the transparency for this, but you expose it in the same way. And this is also developed with water. So I like really like to work as, as non-toxically as possible. I try to stay away from uh, media that I have to use solvents and, and things that give off a lot of odors. And then the other one I do a lot, I've done a lot of in the past is photolithography. And these are litho plates, aluminum plates that have a emulsion over them. And same idea, you uh, expose them with a transparency. And then these you actually use a developer solution that washes away uh, everything but the image. All right, so I'm going to do a quick silk screen demo. I have been kind of obsessed with these plum trees. And uh, here's the transparency. And over Easter weekend, I printed a bunch of these the week before, and my husband and I drove around to all our friends' homes in Ann Arbor, and we left them a print, similar to what I have hanging here. And so I thought I'd just show you quickly how easy silkscreen is. I, I love it because the printing part's the easiest part. With some other medias, it's often the printing part that's the most challenging, but with silkscreen, once you have a good screen, it's not challenging at all. So I thought I'd print some of these lung milagros. I have the screen all set up here. I'm gonna take some metallic gold ink, because I like sparkle. <laughs> and I'm just gonna put some ink across the screen. Okay. A question for you while you're doing that. Sure. Um, oh, let me pull it back up. Um, Linda wants to know the poet that you referenced earlier, was it John Milton? John Milton, Paradise Lost, where all the demons are. Thank you. Okay, so I flooded the screen, and now I've already got a sheet of paper under there. Now I'm going to just pull the ink back across and pop this up. And voila, let's do another one. So you flood the screen. You flood the screen so you fill it with ink. I have marks under here to register the paper in the right place. And then you drop the screen back down and you basically pull the ink back across the image and then pop the screen up and voila. Let me do a couple more. One more. What happens to these when you finish them, John? Okay, people, get ready. The first four people who type in the name of their favorite female visual artist will get one of these prints sent to you from me and Peter. And here's the last one. All right. So that's all for me. While I quickly clean up, Peter is going to give you a tour of the garden and I will catch up with you and I'll become his videographer. I'll see you in a moment. Thank you, John. You're a real pro, <laughs> I tell you. So when John and I bought this house in 89, uh, it was pretty much uh, waist high scrub grass. Uh, John is a master green thumb, uh, if there is such a thing, and has uh, transformed it into our own little a little house of art on Walter Drive. This is the garage we were just in that was once a garage. Uh, I think we had the red maple and we had our beautiful canopy of oaks up back here bordering Hazley School. Um, when I knew I was going to retire from U of M two years ago, John's idea was that he'd better get me out of the house because we had no space for my studio. So we asked Nick Dury of, of Oak Leaf Design Build to help me conceive of a pavilion of sorts that would serve me as a, a dance space, a video space, painting studio, and writer's retreat. I'll take you up the steps. Okay, um, now I'm gonna take over, I'm back. <laughs> And I should say, if you didn't win one of the prints, I do have them for sale on my Etsy store. It's called Visually Hungry. And I have the prints for sale there and they're $30. So good luck to, uh, congratulations to whoever won. Elizabeth will let us know. Thank you. This is my studio, 12 by 18. Um, maximum to call it a shed. It does not have plumbing. 
but it does have heating and of course lighting. Um, our idea was to have high windows for maximum lighting uh, to allow for maximum wall space to hang paintings. John's idea was to line it with homosote so I could pin uh, things up at will. What you're seeing is uh, a set of more recent paintings. I like, perf I like performing there, that was a slip. I like presenting the human figure in series uh, a la Moybridge, perhaps, where you see series of moving figures in stop action, uh, uh, creating a kind of a movement sequence. So here you have five uh, backs of Davy Jensen. Uh, this is a, a recent series of seven standing figures. Uh, I was, I'm really interested in a kind of life size. I'm also very uh, enamored with the stroke of the brush, the idea that the stroke of the brush, the application of this, of this uh, uh, viscous acrylic paint strikes me so much as uh, the sensation of dancing and moving in space. I see no, uh, no difference, if you will, in the translation from my body as a moving instrument to holding the paintbrush and applying it. I use my own image as a subject quite a bit because, especially in this pandemic, there's just me or John, and he's not very willing to be my subject. Uh, here you have something <laughs> called uh, uh, Purple Haze. Uh, again, the need to create something more ascending. Uh, John's idea was to add the glitter uh, to give it that kind of surreal, um, gay feel about it. Um, down here you have another, this, this is one of, three series called Whirling Dervishes, where I use a, 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 my Canon camera to capture 10 quick successions in burst mode. And then I select it from that succession with me, essentially just twirling in the space. <laughs> um, I love the twirl. Uh, over here you have a triptych, I love triptychs of a, a really fine dancer, Mario Bersha from Costa Rica. This, I love accompanying John uh, to antique markets. He shops for colored glass and I shop for old paintings. This paint by number inspired Jesus Daddy, where I took this kind of traditional Jesus image and imagined Jesus surviving the crucifixion and coming out late in life and uh, shepherding his flock. A little subversive, but hey. Um, this is a homeless person I saw in DC. Mario again. Another uh, antique mall find of a vase with a floral arrangement. I wanted the frame. So I left this um, canvas, unwanted canvas right until I thought, why don't I paint a torso around it so that this uh, vase is at like, I call it womb man. I'm, I'm opening up and blossoming from within. Uh, so let me show you how I put this all together. Um, John mentioned his efforts to kind of address the pandemic. I did a series of three videos um, where um, I'm raiding the Prelinger archive for vintage footage. I've written poems that address the daily issues of waking up and being in isolation. Um, I love this idea of using video technology to essentially film myself in the studio against green screen. And that with chroma key allows me to drop any backdrop into it so that I, in a sense, can put myself in, in any environment. Um, and this music actually is Frank Paul's music. Thank you, Frank. These are all on my video website. Peter Sparling on Vimeo. This is a, a image of a video that uh, was inspired the first week of the pandemic, actually. I was kind of freaking out, and I thought, I need to celebrate life. I need, uh, and what better way to do that than to raid John's um, stash of gorgeous prints. So I selected some of his prints and inserted myself using this gorgeous music by Benjamin Britten, Les Illuminations, the poems of uh, uh, Rambeau. 
And this again uh, works with green screen. I want to give you a little demo now of this green screen. Um, I just need to get rid of this. Bingo. Oh, it's not letting me. Oh, just let it go. Um, my friend Yehuda Yanni, a, a composer from Milwaukee, posted this on his Facebook page, oh, maybe four days ago. And it's, you'll see it. His response to the pandemic is that he, um, out of utter frustration, what does he do? His first note is struck with his elbows. And that became the theme for my video. I asked Yehuda if I could use his piano score to make a video. He graciously agreed. Um, and that began the process for me of creating a video to Yehuda's score. Here I am on Final Cut Pro. Uh, in this very studio, I shot four improvisations to Yehuda's music. And when I dropped it into Final Cut Pro, I decided mm, two of the four are pretty good and they actually work together as a duet. So I dropped chroma key, which allows me to float the figure in a black void. I then brought the figures together into a more closer proximity and created a duet with the two of me. I often clone my figure. This is, comes in very handy, handy during a pandemic as well. <laughs> And so I created this duet. I projected it onto an empty canvas, and I began to paint around the figure. And what I ended up with was a dance where I am housed within my own paintings. And the idea was to have a different painting uh, appear, or a different uh, evolution of the same painting shift with each of Yehuda's piano notes. So you hear Yehuda's piano notes, and with each of those, I, I actually stop the image on my canvas to paint around it and develop the screen. I didn't really count the number of paintings I did for this video, but they're probably close, close to about 80. This is a direct um, development of my 50 years of experience as a dancer choreographer on stage. Uh, the screen becomes my stage, the rectangle of the frame, the proscenium, and uh, I can, again, combine painting with video with movement. So you get the idea. And again, these are all on Vimeo, YouTube. Um, I have found during the pandemic that I, it's business as usual. I'm a kind of a hermit back here. Uh, I, John and I both really miss contact with friends and with the ability to go to our gyms. I'm an avid swimmer and I'm dying to be in the water again. Um, this space gives me just enough space to get on the floor and do my stretch. I'll stand at the ladder and I'll do my ballet bar just to make sure I can still move, etc. Um, <laughs> and he's religious about it. <laughs> John, I, I find I can't help but address the situation we are in. It, it amplifies uh, a sense of isolation and it makes me feel I need to be even more self sufficient as a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary artist. Also, uh, my videos that I uh, submit to various film festivals, uh, I thought that would be it during this pandemic, but thank goodness these film festivals have been able to quickly uh, retool. For example, Leslie Raymond and her amazing staff at the Ann Arbor Film Festival were able to convert the entire festival online for live streaming 
So my um, Seven Elegies was featured on that festival. I had a film in, the, in a festival out of Seattle, Cadence Video Poetry Festival, and I have two films this summer, um, one at the American Dance Festival, Mo Movies by Movers, and also at the New York Dance on Camera Festival. So in a sense, I can, I can work from remote for my home studio. John, I think we should uh, end the tour by uh, going back into our home. I think you need to show our guests your glass collection. Well, that's great. We weren't sure if we were going to have time, so I'm going to hand that over to Peter. You know, when we ran through this yesterday, it went a lot slower. <laughs> Nerves are an energizer. <laughs> so we're going to walk back through the gallery. Would you guys like to see some of my glass collection? <laughs> oh, I hear that. Rousing, yes. <laughs> I always say I'm an artist and a designer and a collector because really throughout my life, my collections have informed what I made. I used to do a lot of mixed media found object assemblage work. And uh, now I do a lot of mixed media monoprint, and I like working with found objects, found images. So we're going to go back to the clouds. A little bit of tea time here. <laughs> the kitchen. We'll turn the lights on. John's collection of, of amazing glass. vintage glassware. We'll start here. So, you know, I have a theater background, and when I first was working, I was in a lot of thrift stores and resale shops looking for props and costumes. And I started buying housewares for my apartments where I was living, and I just started to fall in love with vintage glass. Started with Pyrex, and then it just sort of grew from there. And I, I love history, I love design, I love finding things and trying to find out about them, who made them, how they were made. Um, up here, up here, this is really what started me was all the Pyrex. And I really like the sort of solid colored Pyrex. Let me lift this up. And then over here is another <laughs> shelf. There's a lot of it. You'll see we have a lot of display. I feel like I'm living in a glass house, so I do not throw stones. So a little, it's, it's really kind of everywhere. <laughs> so it's all, some of it is is a uh, barber that I know about. Some like some of this, these glasses are made by Blanco, which still is in production after 127 years. They're about the only American glass studio that's still- Show us those queer prints. Queer prints. Those are prints I did in grad school. This is a magic disco shoe that would transport you before AIDS happened. And this I called a flaming sacred triangle. It sort of represented all the possible forms of queerness. And the triangle being, you know, used in the AIDS epidemic as a symbol of solidarity, but was originally used to mark uh, homosexual prisoners in the concentration camps. Um, oh, I'll show them the dreadlock mirror. <laughs> That's a mirror made with gum chain. You know, when I did the art fairs, I did a lot more work that was um, made from found objects. And I did a series of mirrors. That's one of them. More glass over here. <laughs> there's just, I just love, there's something about glass that just thrills me. Uh, I love the shine of it. I love the sparkle of it. And I actually, at one point, took a summer of glass blowing locally. Uh, and I loved it. But it, I have to say, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever tried to make was glass. These are prints I've done that are inspired by glass. This is all Blanco pieces, and these are actually all pieces made by Blanco. Almost all of these were made in the mid-century, last century. And then that's Rainbow Glass, which was another American glass company, no longer in existence. And I, all the bottles in there I own. I started really, I love the decanters, and that's what I started doing. What is this made of, John? That's a mandala I made out of cigar bands. Um, again, that was a series I did while I was doing the art fairs back in the day. Yeah, and then over here is the wall of glass where we started earlier. Um, I also collect some European glass. There's a lot of Italian glass in there that was made in the 60s and 70s. If you're my age, you might remember seeing those giant goblets in people's homes um, or the giant um, vases, the flutes and all that stuff. A portrait of the collector, John. Uh, that Peter did by yours truly. One of his paintings. And then more glass in the back window. <laughs> it, it is, it's a little embarrassing, but I actually don't care because I get so much joy out of it. And I love the way it makes the house look when light comes through it. So yeah. 
So here, here we are back where we started. You gonna come and join me? I will. All right. Well, thanks for the for joining us today. Um, there may be questions. I don't know, Elizabeth. Or are we able to answer any questions now, or have we just so awed the audience <laughs> that they are stunned? I think you did awe them because that was a really awesome. Um, just studio tours and showing off your work. That was so cool. Um, so if anyone has questions, um, if you've been holding on to them, feel free to leave them right now in the comment section or um, in the question box. Um, and while you're maybe putting your questions together, if you have any, um, how about I let you know who the winners were of the Yeah, prints. who won the prints? Cool. So um, I messaged all of the winners uh, so far. So you have John's email. But um, first up, we had Brenda Miller. Congratulations. Right, Brenda. That's Emily's mom. That's a, that, that's a family that won two prizes. Congratulations. I will get them to you. Nice. Um, the second uh, second entry was Lori White. Oh, good. Perfect, Lori. And you know why. I won't go into it, but I'm so glad you got one. <laughs> Kathleen Eggert. All right. Wonderful. We will get her a print as well. Hi, Kathleen. And then um, uh, the last one was Tanya White. Oh, Tanya. Hi, honey. Two for you, too. I can't wait to get them to you. Thank you for getting up early and tuning in. <laughs> so um, so I gave, if you have one, um, I sent you a private message, but go ahead and uh, email John directly your, your address and he'll get yeah, those. please do. If you're locally, I'll drop it off at your door. Super. Um, okay, so it looks like we have a couple questions here. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and hide myself, <laughs> and then I'll read them off to you. Um, let's see here. Okay, so um, as two artists and also life partners, it's clear that you inspire each other. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you manage as a two artist household? Um, do you talk about ideas with each other? We actually give each other a lot of space, uh, respecting that of the process. But we're constantly interacting, showing each other our works. We're, we're each other's toughest critics. Yeah, I always hesitate until the very end to invite John into my creative space because I know he will be utterly 100% honest. And that, that, you know, that's tough. <laughs> right. Separating the work from the, the, the relationship and the home. But it, for the most part, we do it by osmosis. Well, I also think, you know, we just can't help but influence each other. You know, we both have a real interest in the human body, the human form, and how it expresses meaning and just the myriad of ways to enter into that. So I think, you know, just watching each other wrangle the body, I guess you could say, sort of just inspiring. You know, I see how, how, how much influence dance has had on the way I work just because I have become, you know, I've got to know so much about dance because of living with someone who was seeped in it. And, you know, I'd like to think, you know, same for him, you know, with, yeah, my interests, you know, can help but influence him. I also say we, we are two on a mission, and it's been that way for many years. Ever since we met each other, we, we were determined to create a household of two gay men who could survive as artists in this world. Of course, being in the bubble of Ann Arbor has helped. I came here to, to work at the university. I retired after 34 years working in the Department of Dance. Uh, but we... Um, we have spent an awful lot of our time in the past three and a half years or so full of rage and frustration, <laughs> wondering how to channel that, how not to feel ineffective, useless, helpless. And oftentimes we just come back to the fact that if we maintain our daily creative practice, we are defying inertia and everything that is working against us. And I think the other thing for me is you'll see in, in between my prints that are serious, I'm making prints about Walt Whitman and Glass because even though I respond to, you know, current events, there's just too damn much with this administration to respond to. So I sometimes just have to take a break from being, you know, steeped in that. But in general, I just can't help. I just feel like for me as an artist, my job is to respond to current events. And I know Peter feels the same way. And I think I think in some way, because we have a sort of similar mission, that that I think 
fuels us. You know, it's not all perfect. We're human, you know. Sometimes we say the wrong things to each other about the work, and you just never know. We're sensitive, right? We're artists. But in general, you know, we made it work 30 years this year. So, yeah. Are there more questions? Yeah, that was awesome. Um, so a couple more here. Uh, first up, Emily wants to know, um, so you had asked earlier what some of the audience's favorite queer artists um, were. So uh, do you have some favorites? You know, I, there, I have a lot of them actually. You know, I did my graduate work in, I did a, a certificate program in LGBTQ studies. So I actually really did a lot of research on queer artists, both contemporary and old. There's somebody I would point out that I think a lot of people don't know about. His name is Stephen Arnold. And he was a photographer in, on the West Coast in San Francisco. He died of AIDS, but he, he was kind of in some ways um, a little bit of, of the key pairing, but what he did was he, with just basically brown craft paper and paint and his body, he, and other people's bodies that he also painted, he created these amazing photographic dioramas. And one of the things I became fascinated with when I studied this idea of queer art is, is this idea of materials that are considered queer. And I just, I became so enamored of that. But the idea is, is that queer materials are materials that are inexpensive, that are easy to get to, things like colored tissue paper and cellophane and glitter, you know. Think of the floats you, if you made floats in high school, how you made flowers out of Kleenex and tissue paper flowers. And so um, there, are, there are a lot of artists who, who have taken this idea of low materials, we could call those low materials, and through sort of ma the magic of art, elevate those low materials into something quite high and amazing. And so I love that idea of, of these low materials as a queer, you know, sort of outsider materials, not, not the normal materials, the weird materials. So check out Stephen Arnold. Of course, I think of Francis Bacon, one of my favorite painters, um, and uh, a, a whole host of Renaissance painters, uh, also writers. Mark Doty's new book on Walt Whitman is just superb. I highly recommend it. Um, Bill T. Jones is a dancer, Keith Haring, of course. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of inspiration out there. Wonderful. Um, okay, so one more question uh, for both of you. Um, you both built great careers in the arts. Um, do you have a project or a series that you're most proud of? Well, I do. I, I did a series called 49 Elegies uh, from the Pulse nightclub massacre a few years ago. I made 49 prints uh, to um, represent the 49 different, um, the 49 people that were murdered that night. I was quite proud when last year it was shown in Orlando um, at the uh, Historical Society there for the third anniversary where they had um, all works by American artists who had responded to the Pulse nightclub. So I, I'm pretty proud of that one. I put my heart into it. I, I immediately think of the 24 short videos I made, I made to the uh, Schubert song cycle, Winterreise. And, um, it was scheduled to have its premiere with live music at the Great Lakes Chamber Music Festival uh, next month, but that has been canceled and uh, rescheduled for next summer. Uh, but that was inspired by one of my favorite composers. I made 24 separate short videos, oftentimes going up north and filming uh, in the forests and on frozen lakes, that kind of thing. So. I'm very proud of that, and I look forward to having that screen in a recital hall alongside live tenor and pianists. Awesome. Well, cool. Well, thank you, guys. Um, and you can know, can I say one last thing? Yeah, of course. Everybody, we can get through this. Take care of each other. Be kind. Be kind. And vote him out. In November, vote, vote, yeah. vote, vote, vote. Hey, if they have us stuck at home come September, October, November, we're gonna have to be so clever. We have to be subversive and activist and make a lot of noise. <laughs> so we can't help but be political. Sorry, Elizabeth. Hey, that's okay. That was a, <laughs> There's a great, more of us than them. <laughs> it's a great closing. Um, and Power you know, the people. 
<laughs> you're getting to go out and vote. So I think everybody's uh, on that same page. Share your voice. Um, and, you know, thank you guys so much. This was an incredible hour um, checking out your studios and learning more about your work. Um, it was really fun and engaging. I enjoyed watching it, and I know everyone else did too. Um, thank you for I having to... us. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you, Frank Paul. And thank you, friends, for tuning in. Yes, absolutely. Paul. Frank was awesome. Um, so much fun to listen to. And thank you guys for all watching. Um, I did go ahead and link to um, some places where you can find both John and Peter's work um, on their websites and Etsy page and um, stuff like that. So um, that's in the comments if you want to go ahead and copy and paste it real quick before I <laughs> before we end here. Um, I do want to let everyone know real quick um, that we, if you enjoyed um, watching and this was your first time, um, we have another, we have a happy hour program on Thursday at four um, and that's with artist Betsy Stecker. Um, so that's going to be a really fun one. We'll have some live music for that as well. That's this Thursday at four. Um, and then moving into June, we, um, we've got some great feedback on these. So we're going to continue our um, virtual art series. Um, we're going to stick with one day a week. They'll be on Thursdays at four. Um, so I also link to our uh, Facebook event page, our virtual art series page in the comments so you guys can follow along there. Um, so I think that's, um, that's everything I have to share. Thank you guys again for, for putting on a great program. Um, and we hope you guys all come back and, and watch some of these in the future. So have a great day. And thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. All right, bye, John and Peter. Bye, Elizabeth. Thank you.